Hi everyone, uh, I'm Michael Baltimore, professor uh, at Columbus State University in the Department of Counseling, Educational Leadership and Professional Studies. I coordinate the Community Counseling Program. Uh, it's my pleasure today uh, to be talking with Dr. Dan Rose. Dr. Rose is the director of the Counseling Center here at Columbus State University. Has a background in psychoanalytic and psychodynamic psychotherapy. Uh, Dr. Dr. Rose has a PSYD uh, in clinical psychology as a licensed psychologist uh, and also serves as a uh, site supervisor for interns from our community counseling program. Uh, we're real pleased to have him today. He has a, he has a background, as I mentioned, and, and expertise in psychodynamic theory and I, I think it's very, very important. Uh, also, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to uh, have uh, Dr. Rose as a guest lecturer in my counseling theory course which we teach to our master's uh, students here at Columbus State. So um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dan Rose and um, Dr. Rose thank you for being here today. Good to be here. Um, we're real happy to have a chance to talk about psychodynamic uh, psychotherapy or Freudian based uh, psychotherapy. Um, it seems to me that there's been a resurgence and, and renewed interest uh, in a Freudian based and psychodynamic psychotherapy um, in the recent days, uh, Newsweek magazine had a recent article uh, with the title on the, on the cover talking, uh, mentioning that Freud is not dead at this point. Um, as a professor who teaches um, counseling theory, uh, I'm, I'm very much interested in exposing students uh, to the importance of the psychodynamic model and how it can be used even in these times where there's more of an emphasis on brief therapy, uh, manic, uh, the uh, mental, mental health care has changed in a number of ways. So I'm very interested in hearing you talk a little about whether you see there's a resurgence or not, and then talk some uh, uh, and give us a, sort of your point of view about the importance um, of this psychodynamic psychotherapy for those counseling students and even faculty uh, who need to pay attention to this the particular theoretical model. I, I do believe there is a resurgence, and a lot of that comes from um, um, a lot of the work that's coming out of uh, some of the brain sciences and some, actually some of the cognitive sciences as well. Um, as we get better and better being able to map and understand the way in which the brain works um, at, its, uh, at the neuronal level, I think that was a big part of the article that uh, Newsweek was talking about, we're beginning to understand that some of the things that Freud initially saw and tried to come up with answers with, we're now able to, to be able to uh, speak of in terms other than maybe some of the es esoteric and metapsychological sort of terms he used. I think that it's also important to remember that um, what may be the most important with Freud is not necessarily the answers he gave, but the questions he came up with. And there I think it lies his brilliance, and that's very, very relevant. It would be, um, I'm a little disconcerted when they talk about bringing Freud back when there is, you know, there are a lot of research that occurred after Freud that has had to deal with the notion of psychodynamics and all that sort of stuff. That really is probably more relevant and pertinent to the sort of research that's been, been done today. It's also important to remember that Freud himself, I mean, he didn't have just one theory, he had five. He continually updated and revised things up until his death. And to give you an idea of maybe some of the, also the resurgence, the American Psychoanalytic Association has come up with their own version of the DSM. Um, I think it comes out this week or next week. And it is a research-based, personality-based approach to, um, to diagnosis. Um, and it, um, it comes from the work of uh, Drew Western, out of, now at Emory, comes out of, there's just a huge panel of people who are sort of contemporary psychoanalytic theorists and practitioners who were uh, who were coming up, and it's it, I haven't seen it yet, but from what I've heard, it should be uh, pretty amazing. Wow! So it does seem like this is a time for us to take uh, a moment to to refocus on what Freud has offered uh, throughout this, and then those, as you mentioned, who came after Freud. You know, there's there are criticisms of Freud, and and uh, you, you know there seems to be uh, still. Um, the idea that there's some things that are out of date, uh, uh, some of his, his view of women and, and sort of some of those psychosexual stages that people talk about is um, really 
ca casting a, a, a very a, a negative light on a, on the Freudian model. Uh, yet there's so much that this model has offered to students and to those in counseling who want to become counselors. Um, how do you address some of those? Uh, what seems to be out of date um, uh, references? Yeah, well, and I think that some of those criticisms are very valid. I mean, they were talking about a theory that was conceived at the turn of the century, and we've come a long way since. Freud himself, he resisted having his work translated into English or other languages because he said in 30 years this should be out of date. Freud was very much aware that he was, in fact, he called um, uh, some of his theories, this is my mythology, and it's the best I can do until we can come up with what he thought at that time, neurological underpinnings that will make all this superfluous. So, I mean, there's truth in that. I mean, that's, you know, some of it is out of date. That, that's a very visionary statement that, that he saw that this needs to change as we discover more information about it and become more sophisticated about what's going on with the brain that affects psychological function. Yeah, and Freud was, an, was a neurologist. He wasn't. That, that was his training. In fact, um, he did. if Freud had never done anything with psychoanalysis, he would still be in the history books for some of the work that he did. Um, he was one of the first to isolate the neuron. Um, he did a lot of research uh, on aphasia, things like this. He was, I mean, he was pretty well, well known as a neurologist. And if there hadn't been for anti-Semitism, he probably would have stayed in university setting. He also he really reluctantly went into uh, into uh, private practice because he basically had to to pay the bills. Well, with this resurgence, I assume that there are a number of societies and uh, journals and other kind of uh, other kind types of information that will be helpful to the students. Can you talk a little bit about just uh, how, how what's the span of this type of uh, information literature? Well, I think it's, it's important to sort of uh, there are there. Uh, Last count, there are like 72 psychoanalytic journals. So there, and there are, you know, hundreds of books that come out every year uh, related to psychoanalytic thought. It's tough to wade through all that. I think the place to start would be, um, and maybe this is a place to speak about the difference between psychodynamic thought and psychoanalytic thought. I think where this could be of most use, and it, like it's vitally important to students um, when I do supervision, I, th I see it very important and even with practitioners who have been around for a while, you have to have some understanding of psychodynamics to be a good therapist. Uh, that's a pretty bold statement to make, but I think it's true. Most therapists who haven't studied any sort of psychodynamic theory do it by the seat of their pains. And I'm just, uh, and I'm very pragmatic. If you have the research and understanding behind it, that's better than just flying by the seat of your pains. That doesn't, and there's the split. Psychodynamic theory can be used with any sort of interventions. Someone who is using basic cognitive behavioral therapy who has an understanding of psychodynamics is going to be a much more efficient, a much better therapist than someone who doesn't. So psychodynamic theory is broadly speaking just a way of conceptualizing and understanding. Its, it's, it's main use could be as an assessment tool, a way to be able to, to take things and understand them, why they do the things they do, what this may be about, and then tailor an intervention whatever box of tricks you want to use. That's psychodynamics. Psychoanalytic really refers to the technique. And when you begin to talk psychoanalytic, you begin to talk about ways to intervene, specific interventions, transference interpretation, use of the relationship, uh, interpretation, clarification, confrontation, all that sort of stuff. I think psychoanalytic theory really is only of use to people who are getting a certain level of training to make use of it. Psychodynamic theory can be useful to anybody, in fact, I think it's necessary. There are lots of journals. There's a journal of psychodynamic counseling. There's, um, there is the um, uh, psychoanalytic psychologist out of the APA, all these sort of, those are sort of the main journals that might be able to, to, uh, to, to be of some use to the student. That's very interesting. Uh, um, can you talk a little of, uh, or maybe give us an overview of the psychodynamic psychotherapy model? Um, what, what, uh, in in terms of the framework for the use of this ther uh, therapy um, and use of this model, what's an overview that might be uh, helpful in our understanding this model? I think the place to enter this sort of it's first off, it's a huge. Um, there isn't just one psychodynamic theory there. Literally, again, hundreds. It's been around since the turn of the century. There are 
dozens of schools, there are all these different sort of conflicting and competing sort of um, theories and whatnot. The place to start, I think, is just that things have me. Uh, lots of times, uh, beginning therapists when I'm in supervision will come in and they will be completely flabbergasted uh, by what's occurred with them in a session. They just have no idea. What with the what? You know, it's like a truck hit them. What the heck was that? So um, you can begin by by making use of this this theory to give a sense. Okay, well, what happens usually has a reason, and the theory sort of breaks it down and says that. People do things as a way to deal with underlying anxiety. That people defend and protect, and they come up with adaptive ways to cope, to make themselves feel somewhat safe. And if you begin to think about it, the most bizarre behavior, or the simplest behavior, uh, a, um, a patient that comes in 15 minutes late, or misses the next session, that may have been the patient who is compulsive in some form or fashion. The patient who stutters during a session; those are just, you know, those things can have meaning. Um, a patient who uh, suddenly brings food into the session and is eating in front of you—I mean, those things sound like maybe maybe mundane, but they can have some use. And then you can begin to look at even bigger things. Um, you know, uh, for instance, with adolescents, uh, promiscuous behavior, sexual acting out, all that sort of stuff. If you begin to look at it psychodynamically, can make sense. As opposed to begin, you know, it, you run the risk when you're when you're dealing with certain behaviors of becoming maybe um, uh, you can begin to feel a little moral superiority. You can begin to say, you know, why do people do this sort of crap? Uh, what is it, Doctor Phil's byline? Uh, is this working for you? Mm -hmm. That can be that can come down from on high. But if you begin to look at all these behaviors as somehow serving a purpose, that this is a human being who is who is hurting, who is doing the best that they can. As Freud said, making the best of a bad job, doing the best they can. The symptoms and the behaviors, no matter how bizarre or uh, self-destructive they appear, can suddenly begin to seem like they make sense. This is somebody attempting to cope in some form or fashion. And with that in mind, you can begin to tailor intervention. They can make use of the good things that are occurring and the bad things that I think that's the place to really start. It allows you to make sense of and map and understand behavior that without the theory can often seem random, uh, difficult, um, or just impossible to wrap your head around. So, so part of what I'm hearing is that uh, the therapist or a counselor in training uh, should, should really look at all the behaviors coming in uh, to a session as far as maybe there is meaning behind these behaviors. Maybe it's something that maybe I don't understand or looks odd to me. It certainly has a meaning from that patient's point of view. Now, it seems to me that you might get confused as uh, patients bring in a number of behaviors and talk about multiple symptoms or situations. So how do you choose between what you think is significant? If all behavior has meaning, then how, does, how, how might you respond to a student who says, what should I look for? What is most important? How do I prioritize uh, what, what I see? And you can fall into the trap of some sort of a therapeutic nihilism. I mean, um, I think that what I look for and what I help uh, those I supervise look for are patterns. If something occurs more than once, then you might want to ask yourself, is it important? If people are telling me something about the cycles in their lives and the pattern in their lives, then I think they're important. If I'm working with a woman who is in a marriage and she's had four affairs already, then I make the sense that there is a pattern. And I also make the, the um, the leap, there is a leap, that there is a hidden meaning in this. That this behavior somehow scratches an itch for her. And then if we find out what it might be doing for her, we might be able to get her to come up with more adaptive ways. For instance, what if in this case, this individual, and again, um, there are two ways to look for this. There are what go the patterns that are going on and the behaviors that are going outside of the session that she reports to me. There's also the ones that occur in session with I might begin to feel some, some building sexual tension. I might begin to feel that she's making use of the therapy hour in a way that she was doing, having the affairs before. And so I'm using what goes on outside the session as well as what goes on with, within the session. And I can sort of coordinate those two 
and come up with a way of looking at what it may, what it, and in this case, make, let's make the assumption that this is an individual who has a very difficult time directly asking for what she wants. In fact, she may be so bad at this that she's not even aware of what she herself wants. So the therapy may entail me helping her to put into words what it is she wants, and then deciding if in her marriage she can get that. And there's a several step process in that. And making use of the relationship she has with me. What is it like to be listened to? What is it like to have a man sitting across from you who really and truly seems to be interested in what you have to say? And we may find out that's what she was looking for in some of the affairs. She was indirectly looking for something. And you can see where you coordinate. You, you find that sort of pattern. There are these global cycles that occur in the narratives that the patient says to me, as well as the narrative that occurs in the session. Boy, that's, that's very interesting. I, I mean, one, one of the things you're saying is connecting what is happening from the stories outside of the mm -hmm. session with what... Uh, uh, the interaction becomes with between you and the client it sounds very much like the the, Freud, the classical term uh, uh, transference neurosis and th those those concepts where uh, somehow in the relationship between therapist and client that there's a recreation of some of the issues uh, that occur in other relationships. And is that correct? Yeah, in fact, it's more the case in psychoanalytic, uh, which is again the technique. You don't do homework. And if you don't do homework, you have to do hero work. You have to make use of the hour you're, or the several hours a week that you give them with the individual in front of you. And that's very, very important. Um, you, if, if, you, if you listen, the troubles that the individual are having are going to happen right in front of you. You don't have to have them go out and do the work just outside of the session. They're going to have them right in. And I'm, I, I'm amazed at if you know, especially when I'm with my own work and the work that I do with the, with the people I supervise, that if you get people to listen, you'll see it'll happen right in front of you if you just listen. Uh, again, we do the example of this patient who is having multiple affairs. You can begin to feel it, see it right in front of you, what's, what's going to happen. If you have somebody who complains to you about how they're depressed and no one likes them, you're going to find out that, that, they, that whether they know it or not, they're active in co-constructing these events in their life. And they're going to co-construct that right in front of you. I like to think of it in terms of a dance. People come to see me because the dances that they've been doing are usually, uh, at one point may have helped them, but now they don't. So what I want to do is I want to get them to be able to notice the dance that happens between the two of us. Sometimes, again, this is more psychodynamically, just in terms of assessment, I may not do transference interpretation. But what I may do is I make use of the information that I get as an assessment, and then I may decide to do something else with it. I may never actually say to a person, right now you're doing this and this with me, depending on, again, part of the assessment is where they are in terms of things. Um, uh, as an aside, one of the things that I we do in psychoanalytic therapy or psychodynamic is you do trial interpretations or trial interventions, and based on that, then you tailor what you're going to do next. If someone is open to doing the here and now relationship sort of work, that's the work I'll do. If they're not, then I may have to use that sort of stuff just for other interventions that may occur. So this is a very live and in the moment uh, therapy model where you may be using yourself, someone I heard someone say, use yourself as a barometer, that you may begin to have uh, feelings uh, toward the client or have, begin to reflect on feelings. Maybe in that case, for example, uh, you, you may feel some sexual tension develop between you and the client. So this is a framework for really uh, putting your feelings back into processing what's going on in the moment with the, with the client. Yeah, I think it's back the self is the greatest assessment tool you can have. I'm a psychologist, I use lots of tests. Um, however, nothing beats the use of the self. And if, if you can get a sense of what it's like to sit in a room with someone, you have a good sense of A, what it's like for other people to be in this person's dance or their orbit. B, you also, and this gets a little trickier, but you get, have a better sense of maybe some parts of this individual that they're not willing to take, that they may be giving to you you get a sense of ways in which they are unconsciously or reflexively co-constructing the problems in their life. And if you can make use of yourself 
I mean, you just have a, it's an invaluable tool. Again, whether you intend to make use of other strict intervention strategies, it's still invaluable. That's right. You, you mentioned earlier something about symptoms being adaptive and symptoms sort of revealing more about uh, how the person is coping. Can you talk a little about you know, symptoms in general? Sure. It, it, this is an example. It just happened not too long ago with a patient. I was supervising someone, and the, the patient came in and was just being completely combative. Uh, the patient was, um, uh, when the therapist would ask a question, the patient was completely dismissive. I mean, just really being a jerk. And uh, when I was supervising them, they were like just really frustrated. So, you know, the session before, everything seemed to be going okay. Well, what, what's, you know, this was just, you know, they thought it. I suddenly lose all my uh, therapeutic superpowers, what happened? Um, okay, we look at that. That's a symptom. It has a meaning. So I assume two things are going on in this instance. I assume that A, it's allowing this person in some way to reach out, but at the same time it also is defensive and keeps them safe. So it's both adaptive and defensive. So there are two things that are going on in that moment. The person has got the shield up, but at the same time, they're attempting to make some sort of contact. So being a jerk is an attempt at an object relation. It's an attempt at some sort of relational connection. But at the same time, it keeps the other the therapist out. It keeps animosity high, whatever. Well, it turns out that what had happened, one of the things that had happened, is right before coming into the session, this patient had spilled something in the waiting room and in front of all these people. Then they had to get uh, some towels and clean it up. So part of what was happening is this individual felt very vulnerable, angry. They felt ashamed. And so look, if you look at it from that perspective, you can see how this individual was attempting to cope with that shame of being humiliated in front of a bunch of people. So what the, what the patient sort of did was uh, found a way to humiliate the therapist. They went from a position of being um, um, the passive position to an active position of having control of the session. And more importantly, you can see, this is probably how they deal with shame and that sort of stuff in their life outside of the session. And you can see what gets them in trouble. So by looking at that symptom as, well, he's not, okay, you could say, he's just being a jerk. Or you could say, no, somehow this is what we call a compromise formation. Somehow this is adaptive as well as defensive. And if you, make, if you can see that this is an individual struggling again, trying to make the best of a bad job, you can come up with an intervention, a way to be able to get more adaptive. You can, uh, for instance, an intervention might be able to say, right now, you know, I think you're really ashamed and upset because of what happened in the waiting. It makes sense to me. You, know, you really always, you could mirror and reflect initially what they're attempting to deal with adaptively. And then, once you've got under the defenses, if that works, they become more open, they'll begin to talk about what they're feeling. You've got their defenses lower. You can help them to see, once the iron, the strike on the iron is cold, get them to say, well, can you see how what you did may have actually made things worse? Because if you'd come in here initially and said to me how you were hurting and how problematic that was, we could have been on the same page and worked together. I think this is kind of what you do outside of here sometimes. It really gets you, helps you to feel lonely and disconnected. So yeah, there's a way of being able to make use of that in some form or fashion. And to me, the key is, and I said that at the beginning, some understanding of psychodynamics. And there is a body of research in the literature, both in the laboratory and the clinical setting, that deal with this sort of stuff, psychodynamic defenses, ways in which people cope, all that sort of stuff. And if you have an, an understanding of that body, body of knowledge, you can much more quickly recover. I mean, this therapist was being overwhelmed, thought she was, you know, I mean, she was really getting pummeled. But if she had that body of knowledge to draw from, she might have been able to stay in a therapeutic position. She might have been able to stay there and weather what the patient had to say, and then, wants to pay, and then be able to make use of it. Wow, that's pretty impressive. It seems that to me that, that, that you're really talking as much uh, art as science uh, with this particular model. So it's up to the individual psychotherapist in that moment to be able to manage their own feelings 
but then uh, draw back and step away from that, that internal process and then look at how this is being uh, an adaptive, as you said, or defensive um, approach coming from the client. So the, the art may be how does one in that moment interpret and then be able to uh, conceptualize a, a proper reframe or a proper response back to the client. Uh, it all seems like it's in the moment and it's, and it's happening very quick and, and, and uh, a very fast-paced uh, process, at least for the, for the therapist to be able to juggle these various thoughts and feelings and then come up, as you said, be back in position. And what you're describing is uh, the Harry Stack Sullivan, who was uh, uh, an early relational psychoanalytic theorist. He calls that the participant observer model. And you have, you know, you are both a participant and observer. If you were in the individual's life, you would just be a participant. But as a therapist, you have to have one foot in the stream where you feel the water rushing past your feet, you want another up on the bank. And that's what's demanded of you. And there is an art in that in some respects, but I think also with training, with we, you begin to work those muscles that allow you to be you know, to, to be able to keep yourself in those two places. Sometimes, like initially, it, it, the most seasoned therapist, when a patient comes in and starts you know, attacking you, making you feel like you're crap, you may originally, at least initially, be just a participant. One of the things that I tell my uh, supervisees, and it's the first thing I tell them, it's by Wilfred Bean, he says, your first job is to survive the patient. And that's your first job. And sometimes that's all you can do, is you can just be a participant until the smoke clears. And that may take another session. That, you know, you may, you may just have to survive that for one session, and then afterwards step away going, what the heck was that? But as long as you can survive, and initially, survival is just being able to come back for the next session. But then survival begins, you get better and better at this, survival begins keeping that observer status. And I think for initial therapists, their first couple of sessions, their first few months even when they're doing therapy, it's hard for them to be in the moment at all. I mean, a lot of the work they do is going to be afterwards, or it's going to be, you know, uh, 30 minutes after a patient said something. But as you work up the curve and you get a little more secure, you begin to better and better be able to survive the patient and keep the therapeutic instrument intact and be get able to use more and more of those moments. It's never really perfect. I mean, I've been at this for a while and I think I'm pretty good at it. But there's all, there are always patients who come in. I had a patient the other day, I came in in my private practice, I walk out, I open the door, and the patient looks at me and goes, be five minutes late. Now, at that moment, how do you survive the patient? How do you keep that, uh, that observer status? Because I'm in a waiting room full of people, and they're all looking at me, and my patient just went, if I could say, honey, it's my time, you know? So it confronts me, so you know, you have to go, you go back to the session, you sit down, it takes you a while to find your place, and then you find a way to either A, go back to what happened, or B, at least, what does this mean? What does this say about the patterns in this individual's life? How they relate to people? How is this a compromise formation? How is this adaptive as well as defensive? And when you begin to get a sense of the patient, it is. You can see how this patient feels. The only way to get anyone to understand or to care for them is to demand it, is to grab them by the throat and shake them and get them out of it. My image is, if they want something out of you, I take you up by the heels and shake it until they get enough of it out that they want. And you can see where that leads to a lot of problems. You know, this patient has anger management issues, no doubt. That's a, that's a, that's a very interesting example. It seems like that uh, from a, the role of the therapist that you have to be fairly secure uh, in your own place uh, as a person and, and maybe even have done some of your own uh, work in this. So. How, how might you respond to like the Yeah, and then, this is another bias. I mean, you can tell the Kool Aid I drink. I don't think anybody should be a therapist unless they've been in therapy. I don't care if you're going to operate cognitive behavior, behavior, whatever, unless you've been on the other side. I just, you know, you know, does a dentist who's never been to a dentist become a dentist? I mean, I just, you know, uh, I just, I just, to me, it's, it's unfathomable. What, what kind of training, what would you recommend? I mean, just going into psychotherapy, I mean, what would be... 
purpose of that to make you a better psychodynamic therapist? What might what might be the guidelines, or what would you want to have happen for, say, a counselor and training to go into therapy to, to work on? Well, one thing that was helpful to me, and I think it is it is helpful. Period, is to know your weak spots. You know, all of us have all of us have compromise formations. All of us have dances that we do, cycles, patterns, relational patterns that we repeat over and over again. You don't want to repeat that with a, with a patient. Most of you, if we're healthy enough, they're not going to be that self-destructive. But there are, I can think of several examples where I've been called in consultation where either a therapist ended up having sex with a patient or got into a physical altercation with a patient. And there was this slow, it usually happened over time, the ways in which they were caught up by the pain. I can think of one example where a patient had, or a therapist had some real issues with anxiety. And they were caught in a, a transference bind with another patient. The patient was able to sort of extort and make use of and sort of, uh, you know, bring, pull the therapist into this rather self-destructive and difficult relationship because the therapist had never dealt with their anxiety. They're, they're, they really didn't get a sense of what buttons the uh, patient was pushing. And that's why I think it's, it's just it's really important because whatever way you, you choose to, 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 uh, to work, if you don't know your buttons, they're going to get pushed. Well, that makes sense. Well, it's interesting, you, we, we're kind of on this, this topic, and I was wondering about you and your own development and, and, and your training and background with this. What, what drew you into a, a, a Freudian-based psychodynamic model? Talk a little bit about how you began um, as, as a, a student of and, and, and now a, a therapist from this model. Well, it may have started when it was dropped on my head. Uh, yeah. No, that, that's fine. Um, well, I think we, we're all drawn to theories that, um, that reflect our own sort of personal aesthetic. Um, my first experience with, say, Freudian theory was um, in an um, um, AP course in high school, and um, Dr. Wilson came in, and he was talking about Freud. And my thought was, I've known this all along. I knew this before, before he even mentioned it to me. I already had an understanding, and I remember as a kid, when people would talk, I would always be aware there was so much they weren't saying. It's like I had this image that the words were up here, but all the real meaty stuff was below, and nobody ever talked about it. And I remember just being able to have an understanding of that from the get go. So I think that, you know, for me, I was drawn to it because I mean, it's always been of interest to me. I'm also rather, you know, I'm drawn to things that help me to understand myself, the world, help me to understand poetry, film. Um, I like to, um, I like to have a better understanding of things, and this is a theory that helps. Um, theories like cognitive behavioral therapy are really built out of out of a laboratory. They're much more technique driven, and that that, that makes them very very useful. They they have a they have a use. But by and large, cognitive behavior therapy doesn't help me understand poetry. It doesn't help me to understand what, if when Faulkner says all art is the human heart in conflict, it doesn't help me to understand that conflict necessarily. So I think we're drawn in some respects just from, from where we come from, from our own development. But I think also just in terms of utility, that would be my understanding. People that I know who are drawn to psychodynamic therapy tend to be also sort of a, if you're psychoanalyst, there's a sort of a cliche, but they look like they're quiet, they don't say anything, they tend to be sort of brooding in some respects. And if you ever go to a convention, psychoanalytic convention, um, that, that's, that, there's certain a truth in that. I, uh, I went to the American Psychoanalytic Association kind of conference a few years back, and there was a, this cocktail uh, party afterwards. I just remember sitting around with all these people who looked very uh, Eastern European, all dressed uh, to the nines, and they were standing around with drinks in their hands saying nothing. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. All right, so um, if, if, um, if you're talking directly to students about this model uh, and one, uh, encouraging to look further into this model, which has, as you just mentioned, a great explanatory power within it, not only for the therapeutic 
side of it, but also for the individual themselves in this process. What, what kinds of things would you um, want to say to students who, who may have not had the background and understanding of how powerful this particular therapy model is? Um, what, kinds of, what kinds of ideas or, or thoughts might you want them to hear? Well, I, I think the, the, the number one is, and again, take it with a grain of salt. My thought is, if you don't have an understanding of psychodynamics, you're very compromised as a therapist. And most therapists who don't have some understanding are usually doing it by the seat of their pants. And that can be well and good in some situations, but it can really get you into trouble. Again, the, the, when I've been called on for consultation, these are inevitably these are individuals who've had little or no training in certain areas, among them psychodynamic thought. I think it's invaluable. It's just, it's just necessary. There's a troubling thing in the sense that I noticed that uh, um, we've been doing interviews and whatnot for physicians in the, in the counseling center, and a lot of the people who come to us have had no exposure at all to psychological thought. A lot of the counseling programs really just shy away from it, and I just find that problematic because I mean, you know, you should, it's one of the things you should be exposed to. So I think that there are less and less opportunities to be able to, to have that sort of experience. Um, ways in which to be able to, it, supervision is invaluable. If you don't have that, there are a number of just wonderful authors who write on this sort of stuff. Um, I would recommend, um, you know, there's, uh, um, Binder has a book um, um, that just came out on uh, psycho uh, key, uh, uh, what, key techniques in psychotherapy, psychotherapy which is, is good. Uh, Glenn Gabbard has um, which, uh, psychodynamic uh, theory, or psychodynamic psychotherapy and uh, the DSM. Um, uh, and what he does is he goes through every one of the DSM categories and talks about the psychodynamic conceptualization of it and intervention strategies from a psychodynamic perspective. It's just in value. It's actually the uh, best selling psychiatric text ever since its um, publication, every year he updates it. It's just a phenomenal text, but it's very useful. Also, Nancy McWilliams has a wonderful book called Psychoanalytic Diagnosis. It's just invaluable. I think those are just really wonderful texts to be able to, to hold on to. There, uh, Laborski has a textbook, um, Principles of Psychodemic Psychotherapy. Uh, Stroop and Binder have one called um, Psychotherapy in a New Key. There are a number of those sorts of uh, sorts of texts, and they all have sort of their very angle that they work from. But I think those are good places to, to get started. If you. Well, that sounds good. Thank you very much for those references. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, one of the issues you mentioned a moment ago was about supervision, and that's part of your practice at the counseling center. Um, I assume that in in supervision, you're doing. Um, similar things that you might do in psychotherapy itself and you're looking for the supervisees um, meaning behind the, the issues that they're talking about of bringing up. Could you take just a moment here uh, to, to describe the supervision process using the psychodynamic model and some of the things that that you become aware of through your work a, as a supervisor? You can sort of see as a continuum. On one end there's the more didactic areas where you actually sort of teaching and explaining. And then there's, on the other end, there's the much more, almost a therapeutic model. Got to be careful because you, this is supervision, not therapy. But a little bit of both works well. On the therapy end, what I might do is, if a supervisee comes in and uh, they're talking and they're, uh, I notice that when they, uh, when they speak about the patient that they seem anxious or uncomfortable, I might draw attention to that, not in a way that's and I say, well, let's, let's slow this down. I often sort of metaphorically say, well, let's imagine that, you know, we, this is on tape. Let's, let's put it on pause and rewind and see. And a moment ago, we were talking about the patient, and you seemed, you know, you seemed like really anxious, like you were fidgeting and stuff. You know? And that opens up the possibility of exploring what the patient's impact is on the um, supervising. And that begins us to talk about what's it like, what it's like to be in patient's presence, um, what it might, what buttons it might be pushing for the supervisee. I really look for the affect, the emotional content of the presentation. Um, one supervisee I was working with a while back began to see this patient more than once a week 
and they were making phone calls to the patient to, to check up. Well, I know that they weren't doing that with any of their other patients. So I say to them, well, what, you know, let's, you know, not again, not in a judgmental or attacking way, but let's slow this down. You don't do that for them, but you do it for this person. Let's explore what that's about. And really open up some important things. What was going on at the time, and what the, the, the therapist was being drawn into, the dance that the two of them were doing. That's the more sort of therapeutic end. The more didactic I get people, I simply ask, you know, the question I always ask, what itch does it scratch? What are they doing? What purpose is this? And we sort of brainstorm about that. We conceptualize, you know, based on the patient's history, what could this behavior mean? How could the history of this patient, in some respect, be bleeding into the moment? How could the past be being resurrected in the moment? We just sort of, you know, I get them to name defenses. What defense do you think is going on here? You know, what, um, um, we really just sort of, and I'll even explain a concept, like what a very important concept is a thing called the adaptive context by, uh, by Langs. And I'll say to them, and what the, what the adaptive context is, every therapy session has a central theme or issue that's being worked on or worked through or worked against. I ask them, what, if, what do you think is the theme of this session right now? What's going on? What's being defended against? And that would be sort of, Again. That's very interesting. Um, I, I was wondering about um, some of the things that we talked about at the beginning of our conversation today that you mentioned, the, uh, and, and I think I, I, I mentioned as well, the, a resurgence of interest in, uh, in the Freudian-based uh, psychotherapy, and, and particularly with some of the latest research in brain mapping and MRI work and where they're locating centers in the brain and so forth, that uh, th that's, that's kind of coming back in vogue and people should be much more aware of it. It was almost as if Freud predicted some of that in, in some way. It certainly was an interest. So. Um, um, Final thoughts on uh, our discussion today about the future and where, where you see things going for psychodynamic theory that are based on Freudian work. I think the neurological edge is, is really important. There's a wonderful theorist, uh, researcher, neuropsychologist by the name of Mark Solnes. He started a new journal called the Journal of Neuropsychoanalysis. And um, he has, I mean, like Nobel Prize winners uh, in neurology and whatnot who are who were involved in his research. He's gotten a lot of funding from it. Um, I see that as just, just wonderful stuff. Um, uh, there was a, a dominant theory of Fritz's dreams. That was sort of the rural road in the unconscious, according to Freud. A lot of Solomon's work on, on dreams, really some, some things that were initially discredited, discredited from Freudian thought, have really been put back on the table in ways, you know. So you begin to see, you know, I, again, I would say, that it isn't so much the, uh, the the answers. Some of the answers for it, Dave, are pretty good. But the questions that he was able to ask there, I think, is where there's a lot of right research. There's a lot more outcome studies. I think that short-term therapy has had its day, and I think there's actually a resurgence in longer-term stuff. Um, some of the Binder's research shows that even cognitive behavioral therapies now go on for more than six months. Um, so you're seeing that as we begin to work with more and more difficult, um, you know, when you move away from just dealing with symptom, you begin to see that longer term therapies are going to be more and more important. In my own private practice and the work that I done that I do, short term therapies can only provide a, uh, a band aid for certain things that come into your office. You need to have some understanding of how to be able to do some longer term work. I think the uh, the tide has turned a bit in that respect. So I think that, you know, psychedelic theory is going to be... And the other thing, I've said it a thousand times, but an, an understanding of psychodynamics is just key. It's a cornerstone to good work. You need to have some understanding. Well, listen, thank you so much uh, for taking the time today to talk with me about this. And, and uh, I think uh, our audience are very appreciative, appreciative of what you've done today. And uh, I look forward to working with you uh, continued in the future. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts about psychoanalytic theory. Thank you.